Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Breast Cancer Network's webinar this afternoon. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to connect. I see that people are joining as the waiting room opens. We'll just give your technology a minute to, to catch up with us. Hopefully you can hear me. If you can't hear me, you can just see my lips moving. So hopefully you're, you're able to see if you're on mute, get the level set right, that you should be able to see the screen that we're sharing. And again, I still, still see people coming in. So we'll give just another moment for everyone to connect to technology before we begin this afternoon's session. And welcome again, if you're just joining us, we're just taking a moment to let everyone connect to the session for today. Right, I think I see the, the registration are slowing down a little bit. So I think that we have everyone in the room who is waiting. So on that note, I think we can begin. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, where we'll be learning more about the role of precision oncology in the treatment of breast cancer. I'm Jen Gordon, the Director of Operations with the Canadian Breast Cancer Network. And before we get started with today's session, I just wanted to cover a couple housekeeping items. So we will be recording this session today and it will be posted on our website uh, later on this week. I will share that link in the chat. And it also has uh, webinars that were recorded previously. So you could take a look if there's anything that would be of interest to you um, on the same page. I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to our sponsors for this event, our gold sponsor, Beatrice, silver sponsors, Novartis and Roche, and our bronze sponsors, AstraZeneca and Pfizer Oncology. And the format for today's session is that we will have a presentation by our expert speaker who will then take questions at the end of the presentation. However, please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A uh, button. You can either find that probably top or bottom or side of your screen, um, and then that will queue your question up for the end of the session. I would now like to welcome uh, the host for this session, Kathy Amandalea, who is the chair of the board of the Canadian Breast Cancer Network. Kathy has been working with the CBCN for over a decade now, uh, and as someone with the lived experience of having a breast cancer diagnosis, really understands and appreciates how the latest research and advancements in treatment are critically important for patients. So Kathy, I'll turn it over to you, welcome. Thanks, Jen. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am pleased to welcome and introduce our expert speaker, Dr. Brandon Sheffield. Dr. Sheffield is a pathologist at the William Osler Health System in Brampton, Ontario. He is also the medical director of immunohistochemistry and molecular pathology and the physician lead of research at the William Osler Health System. Dr. Sheffield focuses on the delivery of personalized medicine and precision oncology and making molecular testing available to cancer patients in Canada. Dr. Sheffield, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge on what can be seen as a very complex topic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Kathy, for that great introduction. And, and thanks everybody for coming and for having me here today. It's, um, it's great to get a chance to, to talk to everyone uh, and to share a little bit about uh, what we do. Uh, especially because um, as pathologists, we're, uh, the work that we do in cancer and breast cancer can uh, sometimes be a bit hidden uh, from patients. So it's, uh, it's nice to give everyone a, a bit of a glimpse as to what happens behind closed doors in the hospital laboratory. Uh, so if you just give me one second here to uh, uh, share my screen, we have some slides to show. And as mentioned, uh, this is meant to be an interactive session, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat or to hang on to those uh, until the end of the talk. We're scheduled to, to talk for about 30 minutes, and then the, the final half of the presentation will be uh, dedicated for questions and discussion. So if you have anything you'd like to discuss further, uh, by all means, uh, please hang on to that until the end of the presentation. So uh, this is this is me. Uh, if, if the, the little box in the corner is too small. This is a, a photo of, of me at work as a pathologist. And 
this is really what, what work looks like for any pathologist. Uh, we essentially sit in, in an office, uh, we have access to a microscope, and we play a role in cancer care by making diagnoses. So if anybody's ever had a biopsy, um, that biopsy after it's taken would be sent into the hospital laboratory. Uh, it would be processed and made into a glass slide. And you can see under the microscope, there's a little glass slide uh, right here. And in between those two pieces of glass is a section of tissue, which could be taken from a, a breast lesion, for instance. And it's four or three or four microns thick, which is three or four thousandths of a millimeter, so much thinner than a strand of hair. It fits in between two pieces of glass and light gets shown up uh, through the microscope so that we can see it out uh, these little eyepieces here. And then this is hooked up to a computer so you can see uh, what I would have been looking at in the microscope. And it's all these blue and pink cells. And by looking at this, we're actually able to tell what is a cancer versus what might be a benign condition. And then we can tell certain other uh, principles about a cancer. So uh, if, if a tumor is removed by a surgeon, we would tell them about the margins, whether or not uh, all of the cancer has been removed or not, or whether uh, additional surgery might be needed. We tell them what type of cancer uh, they're dealing with so that that can be matched to the most appropriate therapy. And then uh, other odds and ends, like uh, for instance, if a lymph node uh, was sampled, we would say if the cancer has spread uh, to that lymph node or not. And those are some of the activities that we do uh, from within the laboratory. And we usually communicate that directly to surgeons or radiologists or oncologists or other doctors. And uh, rather than interacting with the patients directly, there's only a small handful of us in the hospital, uh, but we are involved uh, actively uh, in the uh, management and treatment of breast cancers. So in talking about uh, breast cancer, this is one of, to me, really the most informative uh, figures uh, around. And I like to look at it from time to time because it tells us a lot about where we've come from and where we need to go, not just in breast cancer, but in all, uh, in all cancers, really. Uh, here, we're, we're seeing uh, the top four uh, most deadly cancers for Canadian women. And uh, we're going to focus on breast cancer right now, which is this uh, green dashed line. And you can see that in the mid 1980s, the death rates from breast cancer were exceptionally high. In fact, in that era, breast cancer was a major cause of death for Canadian women. But in the past three decades, since that time, we've seen a tremendous fall in the mortality rate of breast cancer. So it's now almost half of what it was in the mid 1980s. And really in a lot of ways, that is a massive success in terms of the medical treatment of this disease that we've actually reduced the mortality um, by up to uh, 50%. And that's actually considering that the incidence or the number of breast cancers has actually risen during that time. So probably the biggest reason for this is, uh, as we all know, is screening. And uh, that's uh, doing uh, routine mammographs uh, for asymptomatic women over a certain age. And really that has caused a huge migration in the type of breast cancer that we see in the hospital today, as opposed to the type that we saw in the early to mid 1980s. And, uh, in those days, these uh, cancers shown in blue, these ones that are called in situ or precancers or DCIS, and then these small less than one centimeter cancers were very, very rare. Yet today, these actually make up the majority of breast cancers that we see uh, in a hospital or, and it, certainly in my practice, uh, in situ and small breast cancers make up the overwhelming majority. And, and that's uh, really optimistic because all of these have the potential to be cured uh, by surgery and uh, other therapies in the early setting. Whereas uh, these cancers shown in red, these are very large tumors. Uh, and they're a lot less likely to be cured by surgery. It's very, very rare uh, to see these uh, nowadays, but still certainly these have the ability 
to sneak past uh, our screening strategies and still do present. So uh, today we'll talk about some of the options that we have for um, more advanced uh, breast cancers. Now, the fall in mortality rate from breast cancer is not just from screening. And actually, um, the, the line below, this is the death rate of uh, for Canadian women in colon cancer. This actually shows what, what a screening program would do. Uh, and you can see that the fall in, in breast cancer mortality rate is actually more than we would have expected just from screening alone. So even though screening is that, that major modality that is, is helping to change the narrative of this disease, there's other stuff going on. And those would include better surgical techniques, better radiation techniques, even the uh, increased societal awareness of this disease is affecting the overall survival. Uh, but probably the second biggest after screening is our ability to personalize breast cancer treatment and the systemic therapies or medicines that have become available in uh, the past decades. So I think a lot of it really starts as early as the late 1800s. And this is one of my favorite articles in medicine. It's, it's, uh, it really is a golden oldie where uh, this surgeon, uh, Dr. Uh, George Thomas Beetson, uh, was a Scottish surgeon. And he actually realized that with his patients who were very sick with breast cancer, that if he removed their ovaries, in a lot of cases, the breast cancer would improve. And a lot of people might've thought that was just completely crazy. Uh, but it turns out what he had discovered was uh, hormone therapy. And that has evolved over the past 100 plus years into being one of the mainstays of breast cancer treatment. So in a more modern study, again, over 100 years later, we really refined that technique. So instead of offering um, a surgery to remove ovaries to all of our patients, we, we're much more precise about what we're doing. So this stain in the bottom corner here is what's called an estrogen receptor. So we take a little uh, piece of uh, a tumor, either from a surgical resection or from a biopsy, and we would stain that with a special antibody that recognizes the estrogen receptor and turns brown when it makes contact with that molecule. We would then look at it under the microscope and we give it a score between zero and eight. And in this study, uh, this is by, by uh, Harvey et al. It's a, a famous all red study, uh, showed that when the score is very high, patients will do very well with hormone therapy. But when the cancer is ER negative or hormone receptor negative, uh, there's essentially no point to providing hormone therapy. And we'd be uh, subjecting our patients to the side effects of these drugs without offering them any benefit at all. So this was really the first personalization that we've ever seen. And now we know that about 80% of uh, breast cancers will uh, overexpress estrogen receptor, and these will be amenable to hormone therapy. So then the next big advance came right before the turn of the millennium. And that was when we had for the very first time ever in a solid tumor or um, a cancer that arises out of a, an organ a targeted therapy that came with a specific companion diagnostic. And what that means is we had uh, really a, a drug that would target this molecule called HER2, and that's called trastuzumab or Herceptin. And that was approved, but not for all breast cancers. It was only approved for breast cancers that overexpress this HER2 molecule. It's about 10 or 15% of all breast cancer. So just like for estrogen receptor, we would take a small slice of the cancer and stain it with a special stain that would turn brown if there was a HER2 molecule present. And we look under the microscope and if this turns brown, then sure enough, we know that this will predict a response uh, to an anti-HER2 drug like trastuzumab. And this means that we'll only be providing it for the 10 or 15% of uh, breast cancer patients who would actually benefit uh, from this treatment and sparing the other 90% unnecessary side effects. 
So these two stains that we look at in the laboratory, actually every single day we look at stains like this under a microscope. When we see these images, we would draft a report that gets read by an oncologist or a surgeon. And they would in turn take that report and change that into a prescription for targeted therapy. So those came out, like you saw, around the year 2000. And since that time, we've actually really refined both of those therapies. We've had, in addition to uh, tamoxifen, which is one of the first hormone therapies, we now have specific regimens that are tailored for either premenopausal women or postmenopausal women, and additional drugs and combinations that have really improved the efficacy of hormone therapy. And likewise for HER2, uh, while trastuzumab was the very first molecule that's come out, we've since then had additional generations of anti-HER2 uh, drugs and now have very sophisticated uh, technology uh, to really target those receptors. The latest is, is very exciting. It's called trastuzumab deruxtecan, where that same drug that uh, inhibits the HER2 molecule has now been linked uh, to a chemotherapy agent so that after the, the antibody uh, kills and inactivates the tumor cells, it leaves behind a little bit of chemotherapy to really finish the job. But what's next? So this would have been this drug here would have been trastuzumab or Herceptin that first came out in 1998. And this was, as mentioned, the, the, one of the very first drugs that we've ever seen as a targeted therapy with a companion diagnostic. We then, after that, had uh, inhibitors to a molecule called the EGFR, which is also known as, as HER1. Uh, it's not very common in breast cancer, but it, uh, we see that in other diseases like lung cancer and colon cancer and then have had additional targeted therapies come out in the uh, early 2000s and more and more and more to the point now that uh, several different markers or several different genes that can become mutated in cancers now have associated targeted therapies which can be matched to a treatment. So this is showing the, the exact same information but we're just breaking it up by tumor type. And you know, uh, breast cancer continues to lead, to lead the way. They're, they've actually, in this uh, graphic, they've split up the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer from uh, what's called a triple negative breast cancer. That's neither HER2 positive nor hormone receptor positive. And uh, while we used to have just a small uh, number of drugs, this is increasing over time. So we now have upwards of five different drugs available uh, for either triple negative or hormone positive breast cancer. And what's most exciting too is, is these tumor agnostic approvals. So that means those are, are targeted therapy agents that are available not for breast cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer, but for any tumor type that harbors certain genetic changes that will be amenable uh, to targeted uh, therapies. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. So with, with only a small handful of treatments, we're, we're forced into giving what's likely to be the best treatment, but we know that that will only help a small subset of patients when leave, and that leaves the patients with uh, rarer forms or unique forms of the disease uh, without much benefit from these drugs. But when we have multiple drugs available, we're able to do some sort of uh, genetic testing or biomarker testing up front to actually figure out which of these therapies is going to be most effective and we can predict that up front. And it takes a lot of the guesswork out of uh, systemic therapies and uh, uh, oncology treatment. So I'd like to take you through now one, what I think is one of the biggest advances for breast cancer. And this has really just become available for Canadian patients this year, and that's immunotherapy. We've had immunotherapy available in diseases like melanoma, for about uh, five or six years now, but we just had uh, one of our first approvals for triple negative breast cancer in this past year. So, and this, this is kind of like a, 
really pretty looking cartoon, I think, but it's all a, a digital simulation. And in the simulation, these, these ugly guys here, these are the cancer cells. And these uh, white blobs are white blood cells or immune cells. And you can see that this, this white blood cell here is attacking this tumor cell. And that's really the, the whole principle behind immunotherapy is that we're using your own immune system and altering it in a way so that it attacks the cancer cells. And if you'll bear with me for a minute, we can all do some science together here. So this is how these drugs work. This, in this cartoon, this is a T cell or a white blood cell. And all the T cells, like they're, they're normally floating around in your bloodstream and they have these receptors on, on the surface. And that receptor can recognize bad things that shouldn't be in your body, like bacteria or um, cells that are infected with viruses, or in this case, they can recognize cancer cells. And when, when the T cell receptor, it's, it's sticky for things called antigens. And when it, find, when it sticks to an antigen, and they're only present on, on tumor cells or foreign cells, they're not present on your own cells. Uh, but when it sticks, it actually um, allows the T cell to kill whatever it's stuck to. They're, they're very deadly and they're full of these poisonous molecules that they can shoot out and kill the cancer cells. But all, because they're so powerful, they come with this emergency break called PD-1. And your normal cells, like your skin and your GI tract and your normal body parts, if they're about to get attacked by a T cell, they can stimulate this PD-1 receptor and, and turn it off and say, no, 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 don't kill me, I'm normal. But for whatever reason, which we actually still don't understand fully, some cancers can reach out and stimulate that PD-1 receptor pretending to be normal tissue, and they can turn that T cell off and put it to sleep. And that allows the tumor cells to grow and divide and invade and spread to new parts of the body. But when we introduce immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and these are drugs that block either PDL1 or PD1, they block this interaction. They bring the T cell back from the dead, they wake it up, and then all of a sudden unleash all of its fury back on the cancer cell. Uh, and these have been very, very effective. And again, these are now available uh, for patients with triple negative breast cancer. And this is it in real life. It, it looks much less pretty, I think, than in the cartoons, but this is a real picture. And uh, here, this is, and this is blob, this is cancer. These are the different uh, cancer cells here. They're, they're shown as blue circles, okay? And the brown, this time, is looking at that PD-1 receptor. And you can see that the, the edge of the tumor has actually turned on that PD-1 receptor. And then outside of the tumor, these smaller blue circles, if you can see those, there's another one here and here. These are the white blood cells or the T cells. And they're lining up on the outside of the tumor trying to attack it. But you can see that they're being turned off by this PDL1 uh, interaction. So if immunotherapy was to be offered, all of a sudden this brown color would go away and the T cells would be able to invade right into the tumor and break through that front and uh, provide a very nice anti-cancer activity. So this is what the New Health Canada uh, label looks like. Uh, pembrolizumab, this is a PD-1 inhibitor, and this is available, but in order to tell who will benefit, they ask your pathologist to look at this under a microscope and, and count actually what proportion of the tumor has turned brown with this PD-1 molecule. So they want us to know that at least 10% of the tumor is gonna have this kind of activity in it. And so that's what we're looking at in order to tell oncologists um, which of their patients will do best uh, with, with this inhibitor. And about 50% or half of triple negative breast cancer patients will, will meet this criteria. So, you know, we've come a long way, right? This, this guy was, was into just randomly taking out uh, ovaries. And, and that was really how things were done uh, in the 1800s. Um, you know, we, we learned by doing things, by touching things and by observing directly. 
a lot of that changed when the microscope was invented. This came out in the 1800s and caused a real revolution. All Everything I've shown you so far is done under a microscope. And the one that's behind me right there, it's really fundamentally not any different from this antique microscope that came out back in 18 decade two. But really, we are in the midst of another revolution right now. And that's because we can see much further than we've ever been able to do with a microscope using instruments like this. This is a, a next generation gene sequencer. And we all remember the, the Human Genome Project. That was, that was big in the 90s. And it took us a decade uh, to sequence the first human genome. And it cost a billion dollars. And countries from all around the world had to team up together in order to make that happen. But with machines like this, we can actually sequence a genome now in one day for under $1,000. And that's really because the computing power has improved uh, significantly. The gene sequencing chemistry is still the exact same, but the computers are a lot stronger. And with that information, we're actually seeing all sorts of things about uh, diseases that we never saw in the past. And cancer is the one that we're really understanding more than, than any other disease process. And uh, that's really given rise to a whole bunch of new uh, therapeutic options. So, uh, this is a very exciting one. This is uh, NTRK or NTRK. When we write a gene, for some reason, they don't put any vowels in it. Um, and I don't know why. But uh, this is an example of a tumor agnostic indication. So this is a gene fusion, which means the gene broke apart and fused together with a different gene, and that activates it inappropriately. This is a, a gene that would normally only be activated when we're embryos and developing, uh, but it can become activated in certain cancers. And regardless of what tumor type you have, it doesn't matter if it's a lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, if there's an NTRAC gene fusion, the, uh, it will be amenable to this treatment with larotrectinib or other NTRAC inhibitors. So we're really breaking down those anatomic uh, barriers and we're not treating uh, NTRAC positive breast cancer any differently than NTRAC positive colon cancer. And NTRAC actually, these gene fusions have a predilection for a type of breast cancer called a secretory carcinoma, which is very common in teenagers or, or very young adults. And, and here are two more uh, very interesting new targeted therapy indications. So one is for uh, a gene called PIK3CA or PIK3CA. And if we pick up a mutation in this gene, it means that the, the cancer will be amenable to a targeted therapy called alpelacida or PICRA. And that requires a genetic test that's either done on the tumor or even on a blood sample. And this is uh, these type of mutations, PIK3CA, are more common in ER positive breast cancer. There's another one here. This is uh, for BRCA mutated uh, cancers. Uh, these are amenable to uh, compounds called PARP inhibitors. And the most uh, most advanced one is one known as Olaparib or Limparza. And so if uh, by gene sequencing, we're able to detect a mutation in BRCA. Uh, that would mean that the, the cancer is amenable to treatment with a PARP inhibitor like this. And both of these are oral medications. You take them uh, as pills. And so they're a lot easier to take than any uh, IV type of treatments. And uh, this would obviously be um, helpful information beyond any of the hereditary implications associated with BRCA mutations. So tissue is another issue. This is what, what um, uh, breast cancer biopsy would look like. Uh, this would be done by a surgeon or a radiologist. And um, if, if you've ever been through the procedure before, you know there's this really awful loud noise that's made by a spring-loaded uh, gun. And they take out that little tiny piece of tissue. And this is what it looks like under a microscope. Um, this is, we any pathologist will look at uh, dozens of these on a given day. Uh, but the gene sequencing technology is actually advanced to such a, uh, a high level that in some situations, we can actually avoid uh, these biopsy procedures. So cancers will, will shed bits of DNA 
into the bloodstream. And that happens when a tumor cell dies or explodes or lyses for whatever reason, they're always dropping little tiny pieces of DNA into the blood. And our gene sequencers are so powerful these days that we can actually take a tube of blood, sequence that, and look for tumor-derived DNA. And that's a very, very powerful technique because uh, certain times the cancer has spread to areas like the bone or even the brain where it's very difficult to biopsy and it will be um, very challenging for the medical team, very painful for the patient. And, and most of all, it would be very time consuming to navigate through the medical system to complete that procedure. Uh, so here's this is one example actually from, from our lab where a uh, patient presented uh, with uh, cancer that had spread uh, to her brain and to the bones. And uh, she was too sick to undergo any uh, formal imaging or even a, a biopsy procedure. But by taking some blood, we were able to see that there's a HER2 amplification. We Sometimes we have to write HER2 like this, ERBB2. It's just because um, it goes by two names. But you can see HER2 and ERBB2 are really the same the same gene target. And in this case, we found an amplification of, of HER2, which would suggest that this actually may be a breast cancer that we're dealing with. As we know that 10% of breast cancers will show this HER2 activation. We don't know for sure. And the other, the other cancer type that can sometimes show HER2 is uh, stomach cancer. So, but we don't know 100% where it's coming from, but we can narrow it down to the two most common spots and make it a lot easier for the doctors taking care of this patient to, uh, to check those areas. And at the end of the day, regardless of where the cancer had come from, what matters most really is how to treat it. And regardless, it can be treated with one of these new anti-HER2 targeted therapies. So coming back to where we're at, we, uh, I think that we, uh, as, a, as a team in breast cancer, have really made remarkable progress over the past 30 years. But we're not there yet. We're, we're literally halfway. And I think over the, the next few decades, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. We have a lot of weapons to deploy. We have a lot of new and exciting science that we can really take from the research labs and deliver into the clinics and the hospitals and to really uh, make a further impact on, on the type of success we've had in breast cancer treatment moving forward. So, uh, I just want to thank you guys so much for attending uh, this talk today and for coming to hear about what we do in the laboratory and as pathologists behind the scenes. Um, I, I think that we are very much an active part of, of your care team. And uh, just know that even though you don't see us at your, at your appointments, that, there, that we are there watching over and to try and make sure that everybody gets the best and most appropriate treatment at any given time. And if I could ask for your guys' help in one thing, you remember this guy, George Thomas Beetson, he didn't need anything in order to do his job. He just needed sick patients. And when these microscopes came out, they, it was very hard for them to become adopted because they were so expensive. A modern microscope like the one behind me now cost about $20,000. But now in the era of gene sequencing, this is the latest gene sequencer and these cost about a half a million dollars. Uh, there's no infrastructure for hospitals to gain these types of equipment in order to provide these treatments for our patients. Uh, more than that, a lot of our provinces don't cover these types of testing. And uh, so we really need uh, your help in advocating uh, to make sure that these genetic tests, these newly available and sometimes expensive technologies are covered and available for, uh, for our breast cancer patients when we need them to be. And there's no voice more powerful than the patient voice. So th thank you, everyone. And um, if there's any questions uh, in, in the chat or if anybody wants to ask them live, we can, we can certainly uh, discuss those now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing so I can see everyone again. Oh, we're back. Well, thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheffield. It's so nice to see a person that does the work of pathology, right? <laughs> You know, speaking to us, that, that's just phenomenal. So we do have some questions. I'm gonna start off with a question that I have going back from your presentation. 
So when a person is in woman is in surgery for her breast cancer, the dreaded question, is, the, the, the first question is when she comes out of recovery, what can you tell me? And the answer is always, well, we have to wait for pathology. That would be you. But that is a question, that is an answer that's not very satisfying for the time being because, you know, uh, the, the, the most impactful thing is, is that a patient has to wait for an answer, whether it be a good answer or not a good answer. So uh, my question is around the surgery and what they remove at surgery, the lymph nodes, the, the tumor itself, is there any form of pathology that is uh, done at that point that allows the surgeon to either move forward or stop where they are? Is there something that suggests where what they're seeing? Yeah, the, those are really good. Um, it's a really good question, and it's a really good discussion point. So, yeah, of course, everybody wants to know the moment they wake up from that anesthetic. You want to know how it went. You, you, you're obviously you're happy that you woke up and that you're still here. And when the, the next thing you want to know is did 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 they remove all the cancer? Did it spread to any lymph nodes? And certainly, um, it can be very anxiety provoking to have to wait a few weeks to come back to see your surgeon in that follow up appointment in order to find out answers to all of those questions. The the, the weight that you might have experienced in that time frame is because of a, a couple of things. So first, when the cancer comes out, it gets uh, put into a substance called formalin and it has to get fixed. That's really, uh, for, formalin is very poisonous, but it has this nice effect on specimens that it makes it so they're not subject to decay. Like the way um, if, if you were to remove any tissue or, or have something that was organic, like food in the fridge, and the fridge was not plugged in, it would start to go bad and get rotten. So we don't want, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen to our pathology specimens, and formalin takes care of that. It goes through, it takes about one to two days just to achieve that uh, fixation in that substance. It'll then take another one to two days for uh, the pathologist to take that big, large specimen and turn it in, cut, they, they, fur, they do further surgery inside of the lab to turn that into smaller uh, cassettes or smaller sections. And then those smaller sections go through a series of other steps called um, tissue processing, and then they're cut into those thin sections and delivered about uh, one to two weeks after the surgery in the into the pathologist's office. And I, I sort of liken it to when you, uh, when you take a trip or go on vacation and you check your luggage off at the, at the airport and you don't really know what happens to it, but it arrives at the carousel on the other end when you get there. And, and in a lot of ways, the specimen is like that. Like we don't, there, there are a ton of steps in between and no matter how quickly it comes out when you're waiting there at that carousel, it always seems like it's taking forever. Um, the pathologist and the lab team are so cognizant of that and we do everything we can to make sure that everything is available to you. And the, the best time to get that answer is when you've had a chance to wake up, get dressed again in proper clothes and see, and see your surgeon at that next follow-up appointment. Thank you, that's, that's, that's great, thank you. One, Second part to that is the accuracy of the stains. When you're looking at those stains, just speak to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so so things like estrogen receptor and HER2, these are some of the oldest stains that we've had around in, in pathology. And those are very tightly controlled. We run them several times a, uh, a day. Uh, breast cancer is a very common diagnosis. Uh, but in addition to that, we have oversight from agencies who run across Canada. And what they do is they send us mystery samples um, once every couple months. To, and they know what the ER status and the HER2 status of these samples are, but we don't. And so that same sample will be sent to laboratories all around Canada, in fact, all around the world. We all stain them with our ER and our HER2 stains. And then we send them back into central headquarters and we get evaluated. And these are kind of watchdogs who make sure that the, the staining that are happening in each lab meets a certain standard. 
and is equivalent to any other lab around the world. So it doesn't matter where you get your breast cancer stained, it, you'll get the same result if you're, if you're going to an Ivy League center in the, in the US versus uh, your community hospital here in Canada. And, and I just wanna ask you a question about your graph with the decline in mortality. What are you gauging it with? A five year uh, survival? How do you gauge the drop in, in mortality? So, so that will be disease specific survival. So that's, that's, and what they showed in that one is an age standardized mortality. So they've corrected for the age of the patients um, who, who are dying. I don't know the exact math and how they've done that, but they'd be looking at overall survival over time. So that's why it takes so, so many decades to produce uh, graphs like that. But it, um, they come out each year from the Canadian Cancer Society. And I like to look at them because they're really for, for cancer practitioners and for cancer researchers, yeah, this is in a way our, our report card. And, and it's important for us to know how well we're doing. Right, right, thank you. So I'm gonna have a, a question for you that has sent, been sent in. It's enough from me. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on how we treat cancers with mixed cells types? For example, the person that is writing in says uh, she was diagnosed with uh, weak ER positive, 10 to 15%, and the rest triple negative. Uh, she was treated as triple negative, but would these types do better with some targeted therapy? So to whoever wrote in that question, you receive the correct treatment for your breast cancer. And uh, I think that's uh, those weak positive estrogen receptor cases is they're somewhat controversial in terms of how they're treated. And the reason why um, you might have seen a pathology report that said the ER was weak positive 10 to 15 percent is because those original studies that where uh, those stains for estrogen receptor were first developed came out in the late 90s. But in today's day and age in the laboratory, we actually have much better techniques for staining for estrogen receptor. And they're actually quite a bit stronger than uh, what we were using in the late 90s. So if you could take that same uh, breast cancer that showed a weak 10 to 15% positive today, and you could go back in time and have that retested in the 90s, that would actually show a triple negative breast cancer. And so it makes sense that your oncologist followed uh, the treatment algorithm for a triple negative breast cancer. And, it, and this is my opinion, not necessarily, um, shared by, by all treatment providers, but that if, if you were to treat those patients with hormone therapy, it, it likely would not have that much of an effect, um, but it, it, it might uh, subject patients to additional side effects. And the side effects for hormone therapy, they can be very significant. Things like osteoporosis uh, in, in a fracture, if anybody's had one, it can be very painful. Right, right, right. I'm going to go to the second question that was submitted. And this person writes in that her oncologist doesn't want her to do genetic testing until the first line treatment isn't working any longer. Quote uh, in brackets, eye brands. She's obviously on eye brands. Uh, should she be pushing for genetic testing or perhaps genomic testing? Okay, it's a really good question. So my, my belief, and again, this is, is my opinion, right? Everybody has a different different thoughts, and, and I think it's it's helpful to collect different opinions and see see who who might uh, resonate with you. Because at the end of the day, you are the boss of your treatment. This is personalized therapy. It has to it has to be custom tailored to suit you. Uh, so genomic testing and genetic testing is really the same thing. I don't think that the the words mean very much. Uh, in the, there's not much way in the difference of the meaning. And, and certain companies market their test as being genomic versus genetic. Uh, genome, like the scientific de definition, a genome is all the genes in your body. And uh, there's about you know, somewhere between 20,000 and 80,000 genes inside of a genome. The oncologist is the best person to conduct the show 
So if you want to get genetic testing or genomic testing or any sort of ancillary studies done on your cancer, I think it's best to organize this through your oncologist. It's very, very difficult to navigate through uh, testing on your own. And I wouldn't recommend that anybody try that. Um, but I think that so, some oncologists have different preferences as to when and where and what type of test they want. So I would definitely fall back and default to what your oncologist is recommending. But if you don't think they're recommending the thing that's right for you, it is possible to talk to another oncologist and see if they might have a different opinion about when to get genetic testing. And it's okay to ask for, for a second opinion. Uh, this is done commonly and it, it shouldn't cause any offense uh, to anybody. And I, I actually saw on the, on the Canadian Breast Cancer Network, there's a really nice article on, on how best to approach uh, second opinion requests from your doctor. Yeah, and I guess, you know, some doctors will do something for a patient that they may not do it for another patient in the similar scenarios, because who knows, you know, why? I, I think the best thing would be for the oncologist to explain why it is that he prefers to do it in this way. So perhaps they may go a little bit further with their own oncologist and ask, why are you doing it this way? Because I'm reading this and I know that certain individuals are getting this. So perhaps a little more you know, dialogue would be helpful for the patients. I think so. And ju just to, you could find out why they don't want to do it or why they do want to do it. And, and, and one piece of information that can be helpful to give to your doctors, because sometimes the doctors don't like to ask certain things to their patients. For instance, if, if you were willing to pay for extra testing, or if you, if you wanted to know about what extra testing costs, maybe volunteer that information for your oncologist, because that's a topic that they often have difficulty broaching with patients. Right, right. That's a very good point. Um, I'm going to go to my next question. And uh, in terms of blood testing for cancer markers, this person is asking, is this recommended as part of a yearly screening? And how, what, yeah. are the, what are the frequency of doing this? Like, uh, are all the cancer centers in Canada doing this actually? No. So, so right now, a liquid biopsy, that's what we call it, is it's uh, really the technology is in its infancy. And so, no, there is no current role for blood-based uh, gene sequencing as a screening tool. But the answer to that actually will hopefully change in the future. And there's some really exciting uh, startup companies that are looking to develop blood tests that would be used in exactly this way, where like every year on your birthday, you go for a certain blood test, and that would be a supplement to some of the screening we do by uh, mammography and colonoscopy and pap smear. Uh, but for now, the old fashioned uh, mammography on an annual basis is the best possible way to, to do your screening. And, and I, I, I would say that, correct me if I'm wrong, the tumor markers on a blood test is not the same as what you're describing, right? So if patients, it, some doctors, some oncologists will request a panel of tumor markers, even you know, for breast cancer, like they'll do the, the colon and pancreas and uh, ovarian. Yeah. There, there are some, there's like, um, for, for, for men, for instance, there's the PSA screen, right. which is a blood test for prostate cancer. And there might be some blood-based markers uh, that can be used in screening. For instance, like if, if a woman has a BRCA positive uh, in a family history, uh, we might look at a blood test to screen for ovarian cancer. And, and sometimes those markers are, come in the form of proteins. Um, but, you know, really, we, there, there are companies that are looking at doing blood-based gene sequencing as a screening tool. And that actually does look like a very promising modality for screening in the future. And, and what's cool about that is it wouldn't just be screening for breast cancer. It'd be screening for all types of cancer uh, simultaneously. And probably that's something that we might have available in the, in the coming decades, but not right now, unfortunately. It, it sounds very exciting, but it's also scary at the same time, knowing something is also very scary. So we have to go with, with a little bit of caution around all this, you know, uh, rise in, in understanding what's going on with our bodies, correct? I think Jen has follow-up questions to the topic we're discussing, right, Jen? 
Yeah, so there's there's a couple other questions here just around that whole like liquid biopsies, circulating tumor cells. So given that that's not the standard of care right now in Canada, is there a way for patients to access that? You'd mentioned like paying out of pocket. Are there some of these um, programs or labs that are offering complementary screening? Is it a, is could patients access to access access it through a clinical trial? Like, are there other ways for patients to access that when it's not the standard of care? Yeah, so so definitely there are. And this can be uh, really helpful. It's often used in a second line uh, treatment. So for patients who have already had uh, one line of therapy, right now oncologists are using this to try and figure out what a, what a possible second line treatment might look like. Um, there, are, there are various promotions uh, through some companies that have been uh, that have made this technology available in the past. Sometimes it's available through clinical trials, and sometimes it might be available at your hospital through a research program. The oncologist would be the best person to try and figure out a way that this uh, can be done. Uh, and if it's not possible to do that, it is possible to uh, organize a liquid biopsy uh, through a private laboratory. And there's, uh, there's at least one in Canada and there's several in the US that will offer this, but certainly uh, speak with your oncologist first because um, again, it's, it's very difficult to navigate private laboratory testing by yourself. And I think it's best to have your oncologist do, do that work for you and then recommend a specific test that they would use. Because uh, before you pay the money for something like that, you want to make sure that the results are going to be usable uh, for your treatment. Yeah, and I guess standard, standardized treatments, cares, diagnostics are always the best, right? Because it's confusing to a patient when somebody does something outside the box and everybody else is just within the, the universal care system that we, we have. So it, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard for patients to, to watch both happening. Yeah, at the same, same time. time too, they, you know, whenever a technology, like all this technology is new and new technology is never going to be covered and assimilated into our public health care system right away. So sometimes those best treatments, those cutting edge technologies, you will have to push a little bit in order to achieve those for yourself. So it's all, it's, it's all about finding the right balance there. But, yeah. um, you know, so you want, you want your oncologist to lead the show, but sometimes you need to push just a little bit to make sure you're getting access to, to okay. those available. We hear you. We hear you sitting. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Jen, do you still have any questions around this topic or can I move on to my next No, question? that sort of closed that. And I, I think that they answered quite a few of the questions that came in as well around sort of the follow-up testing and, and circulating tumor cells and whatnot. So we're good to go to the next one, Kathy. So uh, this one asks, uh, this patient asks, uh, or this person asks, how can patients access genomic testing? Where can they go to access these testing? Testings. Okay. So you won't, um, you have to start with your own hospital and that's always the key because the, the tissue that was removed in the biopsy or in the surgery was going to get stored in the same hospital where you had that procedure. So, so that would be the first step. And even if you go to pursue additional testing that's in an outside laboratory or, or through a private facility, you'll still need to get those cancer cells out of the, the storage from that original hospital. So again, definitely start with your, with your own oncologist, talk to them about what, what it is you're looking uh, to do. And uh, I think that they would be the, the first key step in directing you uh, to, to the right person to arrange that, that extra bit of testing. Uh, keep in mind too that Everybody wants to do this genomic profiling. And when I talk to patients, everybody, they just want more gene sequencing and more, uh, more testing done. But we have to remember that the, the testing is best used when we have a specific question that we want to answer. And usually that question is, what's the best treatment for my cancer? So you want to look at what treatment options are being considered what's available and ask yourself is if any genetic testing is going to help give you a clue as to which of those treatments is going to be the most effective at treating your disease and give you the minimal number of side effects. 
So and I, yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, so, you know, sometimes the, yeah. the answer is, is no testing is required. And sometimes there's a really critical test that you might need to access. Yeah. And, and, and the thinking is that I'm sure the oncologist will use every tool they have in order to best provide for the patient that they have sitting in front of them. I mean, I, I don't think that I don't think that they fail to use. I, I have a lot of faith in the oncology world, I guess. Because uh, if it's there, I think if it's beneficial to a patient, I think they would use it. Absolutely. I think um, every oncologist I know in this whole country, and I know a lot of them, they're actually some of the biggest advocates for trying to get more access. They're always, almost unanimously pushing for extra testing. And uh, they, they're probably the biggest advocates to deploy these techniques uh, and use them wherever humanly possible. Uh, so they're definitely your ally in this. That being said, as a, as a patient, and I've been there too, and it's no matter what you do or what, um, what's what been done, you always are left with this feeling like maybe there's some special test that, that, they're, not, that they're not pulling out of the cupboard for, for my cancer. And it is a, it, that's true. And there's, there's, and I don't know if there's anything I can say that would ever make that feeling go away from the back of your head, but it's, I can certainly acknowledge that it's there and that, that many people feel this way. I, I'm sure because many people are well-informed today. So for them, every question needs to be answered in order for them to be satisfied and walk away from that appointment. So, oh, sure. uh, and I think what you raised before in terms of it being a cost factor, it's very important that if somebody is willing to pay for that test that is not available to everybody, that they approach their physician and say, look, I'm prepared to pay for a test if there is something that you feel is beneficial to me. So that's a very good point for patients to advocate on their behalf. Well, and this is something that CBCN is also working on from an advocacy standpoint is looking at what's the framework in Canada? Can we develop that? And how do we start to advance better access for patients to these types of tests? So something that's definitely on our radar. I think uh, we have time for just one quick follow-up question and then we'll have to wrap up. So just in terms of, you'd mentioned that the tumor would be stored at the hospital. Is there a time frame on when those tumors can be used for any type of testing um, when they're no longer, like when you would need a fresh tumor sample or they, they last sort of indefinitely? Or is it an expiry date that's labeled on it? So, so there's no real ex expiry date. Um, certain, we like to test a more recent sample if possible, but sometimes in breast cancer, um, particularly certain types of breast cancer, they have a, a tendency to recur uh, late. So, so that means that cancers that come back after 10 or even 20 years. And in those settings, we, we would be able to access an archival sample and uh, those would still have the same DNA inside of them. We do have to work sometimes a little bit with the, the proteins, like those stains we see through the microscope or other tests, particularly things like RNA, which is a little bit less stable uh, than, than DNA. But uh, really the, the biggest rule of thumb for me is that we don't wanna test a sample if there's been a targeted therapy in between that time. So. So uh, if a sample is 20 years old, but there's been no uh, therapy given to the patient in the interval, then it, that would be okay. And it would still be reasonable to use that for genetic testing. But if a patient has had a targeted therapy, we'd want to make sure that we get a new sample because cancers, they're really tricky and they will develop new mutations that make them resistant to certain types of targeted therapy. So if there has been any treatment, we like to collect a newer sample just to make sure that we're getting the most accurate and, and up-to-date information. And I guess the same thing about it being an older, like 20 years ago, maybe the patient has a different biology now. So that's possible too. It's possible, yeah. So I mean, wherever possible, we, we look for the most up-to-date uh, sample. But um, you know, one of the jobs of, that we have as pathologists is we're the guardians of your tissue. So if you've ever had anything removed, you, you can rest assured that we're, we're working hard to protect that and that we, we're, we're almost like the custodians of that material and we'll keep it safe just in case it's ever needed down the line. Well, I definitely want to thank you personally for a face of a pathologist actually giving us this great 
<laughs> session. I really want to thank you, Dr. Sheffield. I want to thank everyone today for uh, submitting their questions. And I'm sure, you know, if you have any other questions, you could probably write into CBCN. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Sheffield. This was very informative and a very interesting discussion. I want to thank again our sponsors, Beatrice, Novartis, Roche, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer, who made this session possible. Thank you to, anyone, to everyone for joining us. We look forward to connecting on another virtual session in the future. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone.